And when they'd come to a place called Golgotha, that is to say, place of a skull, they gave him sour wine mingled with gall to drink. <clears throat> but when he tasted it, it would not, he would not drink. Then they crucified him and divided his garments, casting lots, that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by the prophet. They divided my garments among them, and for my clothing they cast lots. Sitting down, they kept watch over him there, and they put over his head the accusation written against him. This is Jesus, the king of the Jews. Then two robbers were crucified with him, one on the right and another on the left. And those who passed by blasphemed him, wagging their heads and saying, you who destroy the temple and build it in three days, save yourself. If you are the son of God, come down from the cross. Likewise, the chief priests also, mocking with the scribes and elders said, he saved others, himself he cannot save. If he is the king of Israel, let him now come down from the cross and we will believe him. He trusted in God. Let him deliver him now, if he will have him, for he said, I am the Son of God. Even the robbers who were crucified with him reviled him with the same thing. Amen. You may be seated. It's always darkest before dawn. We often say this familiar adage as people struggle through life. They are down and out, and we offer them this familiar phrase as a source of encouragement to them. We, in that moment, want people to see that there is a light at the end of the proverbial tunnel. But for some, this phrase helps, and for others, the phrase doesn't help at all. And the reason I believe that the phrase isn't helpful to those people is because the dawn never seems to arrive. It seems that they are living one endless dark night. It feels as if the darkness will never go away. It feels as if the darkness, they are plunging into a dark, cold, infinite abyss of which they seems that they will never, ever be able to escape. It's, it's as if there was something that they suddenly had and it was suddenly taken away. It's a very dark place. They may be suffering. It might seem as, as if it's one long dark night. Maybe it's when someone walked away. Dark days. Maybe it's when someone was suddenly taken away and now they're experiencing dark days. Maybe it's when someone that you love betrayed you, and now you are experiencing dark days. Maybe it's when you realize that you are the betrayer. Dark days. Maybe it's when someone very close to you died, you are experiencing dark days. Maybe it's when sin began to wreck your life, and now you are experiencing dark days days. It's the sin that you can't seem to shake, the sin that you can't seem to get over, and it's wrecking your life. It's, it's dark days. Maybe, maybe it's when your purpose in life seems cloudy. Now you are experiencing dark days. See, these dark days remind me of a time in God's Word when a man of God who was God actually in the flesh, was experiencing dark days, a time of suffering. And those that were gathered around him, those that called themselves followers of his, those that called themselves disciples of his, when Jesus was struggling, when Jesus was hanging on a cross, when Jesus was crucified and put to death, these men, no doubt, these men and women, no doubt were experiencing dark days. But it's always darkest before the dawn. See, the man Jesus of Nazareth, a good man, a just man, 
a man who sought to preach the gospel of the kingdom of God, a man who went and taught in local synagogues, a man who went to heal men and women of their infirmities. He caused the blind to see, and he caused the lame to walk. He was a man that came to bring hope, a man that came to bring salvation, a man that came to bring peace with God. And I'm not sure if you are allowed to get close to him, and if, if you were, that you would have probably experienced the brightest of days if you were allowed to just nestle right underneath his breast. But these men were experiencing some dark days in that this man Jesus was hung on a cross, in that this man Jesus was crucified a day his disciples would undoubtedly come a dark day. I want you to see the darkness of this day in Matthew chapter 27. Let's read verse number 45. Now from the sixth hour until the ninth hour, there was darkness all over the land. And about the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, which that is, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Some of those who stood there, when they heard that said, this man is calling for Elijah. Immediately, one of them ran and took a sponge, filled it with sour wine and put it on a reed and offered it to him to drink. The rest said, leave him alone. Let's see if Elijah will come and save him. And Jesus cried out again with a loud voice and yielded up his spirit. Then behold, the veil of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom, and the earth quaked, and the rocks were split, and the graves were opened, and many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised, and coming out of the graves after his resurrection, they went into the holy city and appeared to many. So when the centurion and those who were with him, who were guarding Jesus, saw the earthquake and the things that happened, they feared greatly, saying, truly, this was the Son of God. See, many would count this day, a day of Jesus' crucifixion, as a dark day. And it would be a dark day to most. But church, I've come to know this one thing, that when God is your Father, and Jesus is your Savior. The darkness that is presented is only a symbol of the light that is on its way. Because Jesus, he died, true enough indeed. But Jesus, that same Jesus that died on the cross, three days later, he got up from that grave. So when it is dark, it is only a symbol that light is on its way. Because of that man, Jesus who wasn't just a man, but he was God in the flesh. See, because of that man, Jesus, even when the day is dark, we understand that light is on its way. Because of the death that he died, because of the blood that was shed, the world doesn't have to live in the darkness of night, but because of Jesus, they can have what we can have, and that's called a brand new day. They can have a brand new day. And we have that in part because Jesus was born of a virgin. We have that in part because he died on a cross. But there is a third part that the world needs to hear because that third part validates those first two parts. It's a part that we talk about once a year quite often in the spring. But I believe it's a part that we need to realize on a day-to-day -day basis. See, Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea. He died on Calvary's cross. But then, ladies and gentlemen, he did the miraculous. He got up from the grave. And I, because of that, I don't care what hand you've been dealt, what hand you are playing, what you are going through in this life, you can have a break new day because of Jesus because he rose from the grave we can have what those disciples were gonna have 
a brand new day. It might be dark right now. But you can have a brand new day through Jesus, our Lord. Why? Because he got up from the grave. Look at Matthew chapter 27, verse number 62. On the next day, which followed the day of preparation, the chief priests and Pharisees gathered together <clears throat> to Pilate, saying, Sir, we remember while he was still alive, how that deceiver said, after three days I will rise. Therefore command the tomb be made secure until the third day, lest his disciples come by night and steal him away and say to the people, he has risen from the dead. So the last deception will be worse than the first. Pilate said to them, you have a guard. I'm giving you a guard. Go your way and make that tomb as secure as you know how. So they went and made the tomb secure, sealing the stone and setting the guard. On Saturday, the chief priests and Pharisees, they came together to meet Pontius Pilate. And these are the ones who ultimately put Jesus to death. See, they think that they have scored a major victory in killing Jesus of Nazareth. But what they don't realize is that the victory was won through his death. See, men and women, boys and girls, need to understand this today. They need to understand that the victory over sin, the victory over death, has been won through the death of Jesus. The seal of victory can be seen through what's about to happen next. See, these chief priests... And these Pharisees, they think that they've done something. But see, something is stirring in their head. See, something, there's something going on that they're thinking about. See, they're thinking about the words of Jesus. He obviously made an impression upon them that three years prior to this, they remember when Jesus first came into the temple. And he was talking about, he was flipping over tables and, and driving out the money changers. And they came to him and they said, who gives you the authority to do this? What gives you the authority to do this? Who do you think you are? And then he talked to them about, if you destroy this temple, three days later, I will raise it back up. See, they remember these words of Jesus. It's swimming around in their head. And even though they put him to death, those words still haunt them. So they're saying, we've got to do something about this. Even though he's dead, we don't want any of his disciples to come and steal him away. Because if they come and they steal him away, then they're going to say that he rose from the dead. So we've got to, to, to do anything or all things possible to prevent that from happening. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to go get some guards. And we're going to set them outside this tomb so that nothing can happen. Nothing can stop us killing this man and his message. But I got something to tell you. When God has a plan, no man, no woman can stop that plan from taking place. See, that's why I know it can always be a brand new day. Because when I am focused upon serving my God and I am living my life in conjunction with his word and I am surrendering my life underneath his will, that there is nothing that can stand in the way of his plan. I want to show you something. So they come, Pilate, please give us a guard. And Pilate did this. He, he gave him guard, and, and, and history tells us that these guards, it, it might not have been one or two. It could have been up to 15 guards sitting outside this tomb. But see, that was on Saturday. But a brand new day is on the horizon. His disciples probably scared. His disciples probably confused. His disciples not knowing what to do. In that Jesus suddenly died, wondering what are we going to do right now? A brand new day is on the horizon. Look at chapter 28, verse number 1. Now after the Sabbath, as the first day of the week began to dawn, 
Mary Magdalene and the other Mary came to see the tomb. And behold, there was a great earthquake, for an angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone from the door and sat on that stone. His countenance was like lightning and his clothing as white as snow. And the guards shook for fear of him and became like dead men. Mark tells us that it was Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James, and Salome, who was James and John's mother, that actually came to the tomb on that Sunday morning. They came to the tomb on Sunday before daybreak. And see, they had these guards sitting before the tomb. But when the angel of the Lord descended from on high, the, they took one look at this angel, and they began to shake with fear, and they fell out like dead men. See, they set them there to guard something, but they couldn't stop what was about to take place. See, human beings tried to stop what God had in store for mankind. First, they killed him because they thought killing him would make him go away, but killing him only gave life to so many. Then they wanted to protect their trophy. That didn't work because the angel of the Lord came from on high and Jesus did what had never been done before. He actually got up from the grave. When God has a plan, no man can stop that plan's fulfillment. They killed him on a Friday, but Sunday was a brand new day. And those that experienced what they experienced back then, their lives would never be the same. And I believe if we are to experience what Jesus has for us today, our lives will never, ever be the same. Never be the same. And it can be a brand new day. And when you come to experience or understand what happened in that tomb, your lives will never be the same. And the lives of those you love will never be the same. The lives of all those that you know will never be the same. The world, their lives will never be the same if they understand what happened in that tomb. Look at verse number five. But the angel answered, and said to the women, do not be afraid, for I know that you seek Jesus, who was crucified. He is not here, for he is risen. As he said, come, see the place where the Lord lay. I know you came, ladies, seeking to care for the dead, but the dead is not here. He has arisen. See, I know, ladies, that you saw him put into this tomb a couple of days ago, but ladies, that man is not here. See, ladies, I know that you saw the stone rolled across this tomb a few days ago, but despite this stone being here, ladies, that man that was put inside, he is not here because he got up from the grave. And I'm here to prove to you once again that no one can stop what God has in store for you and the greatest thing that God has done for you is to send his son Jesus to die for you but that same Jesus that God sent to die for for you he actually got up from the grave it proves that Jesus was no ordinary man he was who he said he was when he said I am the way the truth and the life, he was telling the truth. Why? Because he got up from the grave. When he said, I am the bread of life, he wasn't lying. That was the truth. How do I know that? Because Jesus wasn't just an ordinary man. Because he got up from the grave. He said, the angel said, come and see. The world needs to do just this very thing. Come and see. Come and see how good God is. Come and see how much favor he can have over your life. Come and see all that he's done for us. Come and see what his son Jesus did for us. Come and see that Jesus wasn't an ordinary man. Come and see that he got up from the grave. Come and see that our Lord still lives. Come and 
and see that our God still reigns. Come and see the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. Come and see all of these things that God has prepared for us. Come and see one day when heaven shall be our home. Come and see. Come and see. Come and see what's inside this tomb. Come and see where the Lord was laying. Notice that invitation. Come and see the place he was laying. See, he's speaking in past tense. Come and see where he was because he's not there anymore. I'm inviting you in here to see an empty tomb. And the tomb is empty because the body that was there isn't there anymore. And because that body isn't there, that's why the world can have a brand new day. All things can be made new because Jesus got up out of the grave. Come and see. And see, these angels have to establish something with these women. They have to establish that what you saw happen a few days ago, that something miraculous just happened. And I want to establish that with you, ladies. Because there's something that you're going to have to do. I want you to go and spread this news. So I want to establish your faith right here. Because you are going to have to take this back to some people who are ultimately going to take it into the uttermost regions of the earth. See, their faith has to be established. It's a brand new day for them. And it's about to be a brand new day for his disciples. And what the world doesn't know is it's about to be a brand new day for them. See, Jesus had been crucified. He did, in fact, die. But this was another day. This was a brand new day. It wasn't like the day that he died. This was a brand new day. On this brand new day, he did something that had never been done before. Why? Because it was a brand new day. And on a brand new day, you have different opportunities. On a brand new day, you have ways to overcome old problems. On a brand new day, Jesus got up out of that grave. There is a brand new day that awaits for the world, but we need to believe that our Savior got up out of the grave. And it awaits for us. It awaits for the world. But then these ladies, these ladies heard the word of those angels. And I want you to see what they did next. Look at verse number 8. So they went out quickly from the tomb with fear. But they also had great joy. And they ran to bring his disciples' word. And as they went to tell his disciples, behold, somebody met them along the way. Jesus met them. And I want you to notice what he said to them. He said, rejoice. So they came and held him by the feet and worshipped him. Your, your translation may say all hail, but it's a, it's a customary Jewish greeting. But it simply means rejoice. So they're leaving this tomb. They come early in the morning to embalm the dead. But they leave that tomb in great fear, but also in great joy. And on the way back to tell his disciples about what they have just discovered, they meet the man himself. But he wasn't like the Jesus that they had seen before. See, this Jesus is in a new body because it's a brand new day. And so they see Jesus, and he greets them, and he says the first words out of his mouth when they see the arisen Lord is rejoice. Rejoice. Your day has been dark, but now you're seeing me. Rejoice. You've just gone through struggle, an unbelievable amount of pain, but now you're seeing me rejoice. You were grieving over my loss, but now here I am. Rejoice. You came to embalm me, but I don't need to be embalmed. I'm living, ladies. Rejoice. Because it's a brand new day. And Jesus is saying, you have reason to rejoice. You leave an empty tomb, and now you see he who occupied that tomb living rejoice. We can rejoice 
because Jesus got up out of the grave. We can rejoice because we see him. We can rejoice because we have a connection with his father. We can rejoice if we've accepted what he said. We can rejoice if our sins have been washed away. We can rejoice because we have this connection with him. We can rejoice because our Lord lives. We can rejoice. So even if the day right now is dark, just focus on the light because tomorrow is a brand new day because Jesus still lives. Ladies and gentlemen, we should be the most joyful people that anyone knows. Why? Because Jesus got up out of the grave. We should always be in the state of rejoicing. Why? Our Lord lives. We should always be rejoicing. Why? Because Jesus came, he died, he got up out of the grave. So us as Christians, followers of his, always should be in the spirit of rejoicing. But then look what they did. They, they heard Jesus' words. And then the text so beautifully says, they, they clung to him. They, they grabbed him around the feet. They hung to him. They, they wanted to see Jesus so much, so badly, that they grabbed him around the feet. They clung to him. Who are you clinging to on today? Are you clinging to a job? Are you clinging to material items? Who are you clinging to? They were clinging to Jesus. And they decided to show him an act of worship. And see, the thing about worship and their worship for him. See, they were worshiping the living. Because, see, we don't worship a God who is dead. But we worship a God who is active. See, Jesus is a king of this particular kingdom. A king can't rule if the king is dead. A king can only rule if the king is living. If Jesus is not ruling your life, then you have to ask yourself the question, how alive is he to me? Our Lord lives, and because he lives, I can always enjoy a brand new day. For as Paul says in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse number 17, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. All things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. If you're in Christ, the brand new day can be yours. And since I am a new creation, living a brand new day. When I encounter my Lord in worship, I'm going to worship him in a way that shows that I understand that my Lord lives. Can't come in here dead. Why? Because we serve an alive God. Can't come in here dragging. Why? Because our God is active. Can't come in here asleep. Why? Because Jesus, he got up from the grave. So my worship, how I worship God, should show that I understand that he lives. How can one worship one that's living in a dead way? Look at these women. These women understand Jesus is alive, and it means the world to them. How much does that mean to us as his followers in the 21st century? See, maybe we've become jaded about it. Maybe it's just become routine for us. Maybe it's just something that we do on a weekly basis. Or maybe it means the world to you because you understand where you once were. You understand how you were you were on the pathway to destruction. And then someone introduced you to the gospel. And you held the hand of Jesus. And now you cling to him. But maybe the years have passed and it's gone on and on and on and on. But the same thing still remains. Jesus got up from the grave. And if he didn't, and if he didn't shed that blood, where would you be? We wouldn't be here. Where would you be? 
where would, where would eternity, where would you call your home for eternity if he didn't do that? Ladies and gentlemen, you need him. And you can have a brand new day through him simply because he got up out of that grave. And the world needs to hear that message as well. The, there are people all over the world. Some people have never even heard the name Jesus. That's, that's, that's incomprehensible to us. But there are people over the world that haven't heard the name Jesus. And, and, but, but you might not be able to make it across the world. So maybe you just have to focus on your own world. And there are people that you know that have never seen Jesus in action. But they're going to see him in action through you. Because he got up out of that grave. They're going to see him in action by the way you worship him. By the way you cling to him. By the way you surrender yourself to him. They will see that in action. They will, they will be able to, you will be able to spread the fragrance of Christ throughout every place you go. Whether it's your workplace, whether it's the grocery store, wherever you go, you will be able to emanate the fragrance of Christ there. Why? Because he got up out of that grave. See, these women, when they heard it, when they saw it, they clung to him. And we should tell someone, just like they had to tell someone, that the Lord lives, that he reigns. A point that Jesus will make later. That's what these ladies were sent back to those disciples to do, to tell them, the Lord lives. He got up from the grave. That should be our aim. That should be our mission, to tell the world that the Lord lives and how they can have a brand new day the way you have had a brand new day, the way you've been made new. You're a new creature in Christ, a new creation. Don't you want the world to experience the same thing? See, after Jesus appears to Mary and to these women, he appears to two disciples on the road to a place called Emmaus. After this, he finally appears before the eleven, and he will bring them what is the essence of this brand new day, this brand new life. But to see it, you got to turn over to Luke chapter number 24. Luke chapter 24. I want to show you what the essence of this brand new day is all about. Look at verse number 36. Now, as they said these things, Jesus himself stood in the midst of them and said to them, Peace to you. But they were terrified and frightened and supposed they had seen a spirit. And he said to them, Why are you troubled? And why do doubts arise in your hearts? Behold, my hands, my feet, and that is I myself handle me and then see. For a spirit does not have flesh and bones as you see I have. But Jesus, his first words to them were, peace unto you. I want you to have some peace. He's in a new body, but one that has the evidence of what he went through. And now he's appearing to a bunch of scared disciples. And he says to them in a way to allay their fears, peace to you. It's a customary Jewish expression, but in this case, it, it has a significance of something more profound, because it's something that only Jesus can offer. It's the very thing that he offers us on today. It's the very thing that helps us to experience a brand new day. It's something called peace, and it's only the type of peace that only Jesus can bring. You want to be a, you want to have a brand new day, then you need to have some peace, and only Jesus can bring that peace. Turn over to John chapter 14 and verse number 27. John chapter 14, verse number 27. I'll show you the peace that Jesus can bring. John 14, verse number 27. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. Not as the world gives, do I give it to you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. See, Jesus has some peace, and this peace is independent upon worldly circumstances. This peace is independent upon world peace, but it's a peace that the world can know. It is the peace that comes from. It is the peace that comes through Jesus the Christ because he died and then he got up out of the grave. We can have that peace if we believe in him. 
We can have that peace if we're willing to repent of our sins. We can have that peace if we're willing to be washed in water for the remission of our sins through baptism. It can be for you. It can be for the world. A brand new day. When we were but sinners, alienated from God, distant from Him, but through the death of Christ, we can be reconciled to Him. We can be brought close to Him. Him, thus giving us this peace, we can have a brand new day because we can have some peace. Paul said in Colossians chapter 1, verse number 19 through 23, For it pleased the Father that in him the fullness should dwell, and by him to reconcile all things to himself, by him. Whether things on earth, things in heaven, having made peace through the blood of Christ Jesus, blood of his cross. And you who were once alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now he has reconciled in the body of his flesh through death to present you holy and blameless and above reproach in his sight. If indeed you continue in the faith, grounded and steadfast, and are not moved away from the hope of the gospel which you heard, which was preached to every creature under heaven, of which I, Paul, became a minister. We were separated, but because of Christ, we can have peace. So despite our fears, despite our doubts, despite our anxiety, despite our pressure, we can have peace through Jesus. He who died, he who was buried, and he who rose on the third day. That's why we can have a brand new day because of the peace that we now enjoy. But this peace that the follower of Christ is to enjoy is not to be his alone. It's a peace that is not to be selfishly held on to, but it's a peace that we should be willing to share with the world. And if it's not the world, then just your individual world. It's a peace that they should know that Jesus came, that Jesus died, that Jesus was buried, and he rose on the third day. John chapter 20 and verse number 21. John chapter 20. Verse number 21 in God's in John's account of this. So Jesus said to them again, these disciples, peace to you. As the father has sent me, I also send you. And when he said this, he breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. He's telling his disciples, I am sending you out as ambassadors of this peace. And the means and the method that it is delivered is by the good news, is by the gospel of Jesus Christ. That the people, that the world needs to hear that the Messiah lived, that his blood was shed to cleanse me of my sins, and that he proved that he was the Son of God by getting up out of the grave and is now at the right hand of the Father. How did they take this message that Jesus was? was giving them. How did they respond to this? What else did he have to say along with this in order to give the world a brand new day? Turn over to Mark chapter number 16. Mark chapter number 16 as we look at Mark's account of what just happened, of this resurrection story. Mark chapter 16 and beginning at verse number 15. He says this to them. Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He who believes and is baptized will be saved. But he who does not believe will be condemned. Back over to Matthew chapter number 28 and verse number 19. Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even until the end of the age. Are we going to selfishly enjoy the peace, or are we going to selflessly share it? Because he is with us, it can always be, church, a brand new day. Is your life filled with sin? 
Well, Jesus can offer you forgiveness. Have a brand new day. Is your life filled with deceit? Well, Jesus can offer you truth. Have a brand new day. Is your life filled with worry? Well, Jesus can offer you peace. Have a brand new day. Is your life filled with doubt? Well, Jesus can offer you faith. Have a brand new day. Is your life filled with sadness? Well, Jesus can offer you a reason to rejoice. Have a brand new day. Is your life filled with a separateness from God? Well, Jesus can offer you connection. Have a brand new day. Church, we can be made new. The world can be made new. We can be brand new because Jesus got up out of the grave. And that's why, that's why the world needs to hear this message. And that's why we have to be those ambassadors of peace. And that's why we, though the night might be dark or might seem dark, though the day might seem dark, we can have this brand new day. Though we are engaged in struggles, all of us individually, we can have a brand new day. Though we are suffering heartache, some of us are suffering setback, we can have a brand new day. Some of us are dealing with our homes being ripped apart. The day still can be made brand new because of Jesus. And we can have and experience this peace. Now this peace that Jesus offered doesn't mean that every day of your life will be peaceful, but despite the chaos that happens in our lives, we can enjoy this peace because we have a connection with God our Father. See, Paul talked about in, in Philippians chapter 4, he talked about, don't be anxious for anything, but he said, but in everything, you lay your burdens before God, you go to him in prayer in everything. And the fact that we can do that is a signal to the peace that we have with him through Jesus. Because we wouldn't be able to even do that if it weren't for Jesus. We wouldn't be able to do that if he hadn't died. We wouldn't be able to do that if he hadn't suffered. He, we wouldn't be able to do that if he wasn't buried and on the third day he got up out of the grave. That's why the day can be brand new. I'll leave you with this in John chapter 16 in verse number 31. Jesus answered them and said, do you now believe? Indeed, the hour is coming, yes, has now come, that you will be scattered, each to his own, and you're going to leave me alone. But yet I'm not alone because the Father is with me. These things I've spoken to you that in me you may have what? Peace. In the world, you will have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I've overcome the world. You're going to have tribulation in this world. But see, I've come to bring you peace. I've come to bring you a brand new day. I've overcome the world. And now he invites you to come to him. He invites you to, to be with him. He invites you to nestle up next to him the way this apostle John used to do. He invites you to come to him and experience, experience the blessing of, the, of this peace, experience the blessing of this brand new day. And it's my prayer, if those of you that are in the audience on this morning that haven't been baptized for the remission of your sins, that today be your brand new day, that you have your sins washed away. God will remember those no more, and that you can walk in the newness of life and experience this brand new day. For those that have sinned, you've fallen short, and you, you've just been, you've been dealing with it. Sin has been wrecking your life. Today can be a brand new day for you. Repent of your sins, and ask this body of believers to pray for you. If you're struggling in life right now, this can be a brand new day, because Jesus lives. He reigns. It can be a brand new day for you today. But what, what I'm inviting you to do is I'm inviting you to make that known which, what, that you are struggling. Not necessarily what you're struggling with, but that you are struggling. 
and have us pray for you because we have peace. We have this connection with God, our Father, through Jesus Christ. I'm inviting you to come and to respond as we together stand and sing our song of encouragement. From the burdens of sin, this how in the blood, how in the blood, would you, O evil, a victory win? There Prayer for family, for restore health and health of a family member, and that is his wife, Veronica Kern. I did see her here today. Uh, and his statement is, we'd like to thank all of you for your outpouring of support and love for my wife during her recovery. And I continue to pray for Mr. Kern as he recovers uh, as we speak. We have uh, here Kenner Joyner. 
give tongues, she has repented of her sins and asked for prayer for the righteous and asked for prayer for her family and spiritual strength. She wants to wants us to pray for her family while they go through their trial. If I'm not overlooked from anyone else, I'll go to God in prayer. <coughs> Father God, I want you in heaven this morning. Thank you for this day and thank you for the brevity of life. Father, we thank you for allowing us to come to hear another portion of our holy and divine word. Thank you, Father, for Brother Kenyon, Father, for pouring out his heart, Father, for helping us to understand, Father, that every day is a new day. We just pray, Father, that we'll grow in the nurture and admonition of the word and learn, Father, <coughs> through our trials and our tribulations. Father, we thank you, Father, for those that have come. Special prayer on behalf of uh, Sister Tina, Father. You know all of our hearts, Father. You knew her heart before she even come down. Father, we ask, Father, that you strengthen her where she's weak and build her up where she's strong down, Father. We ask, Father, that you be her family as well, Father. Pray, Father, a special prayer upon the um, paternal family, Father, through the tribulation and trials they've gone through, specifically, Father, on the um, uh, the medic, the uh, the things that Sister Clinton has gone through, Father. We father know, Father, that you brought her from a mighty long way, Father. And we just thank you, Father, for being by her side, Father. We know, Father, that you're with her at all all times, Father. We pray, Father, that you continue to be with her, not only her, Father, but all those, Father, that are in the <coughs> under medication or, of course, Father, they're going through some, some illnesses at this particular time, especially that illness of cancer, Father. We pray, Father, that you strengthen all of those, those, Father, that are weak, and, Father, that you would bless them in a mighty, mighty way as well, Father. We ask, Father, that you be with Sister Journal, Father, that you be with her, Father, uh, consider her trials, Father. We all, Father, have trials and tribulations each and every day, Father. We ask, Father, that you would bless us and strengthen us in those areas as well, Father. Be with us all, Father. As we sit before your throne this morning, Father, we all have fallen short in some way, form, or fashion, Father. We ask, Father, that you strengthen us where we can build us up where we're torn down, Father. We all have fallen short, Father, whether it's being spiritually, physically, or mentally, Father. We ask you to bless us and keep us, Father, throughout the rest of this service. For these men are in Christ's name. Let us all say amen. As we prepare our hearts for the Lord's Supper, we're going to sing the verse of uh, B of Hymn. They tried my Lord and Master with no one to, no one to defend within the halls of power. He stood without, stood without a friend. I'll be a friend to Jesus. My life for him, life for him, I'll spend. I'll be a friend to Jesus. Until my years, my years shall end. We come to that portion of our worship, which is communion. If you do not have a disposal cup, communion cup will be raised up high and ushered to bring it to you. Let us show our respect for this occasion, the special occasion, by minimizing our talking and moving about. We are commanded on the first day of the week to have communion. That's recorded in Acts 27. Jesus Christ himself instituted communion as a memorial of the sacred covenant between himself and his disciples of his death, burial, 
and resurrection. This sacrifice was done to extinguish the sin of guilt forever. Today, because of Christ's sacrifice, we have been granted that avenue of living in eternity. The eating of his bread is his broken body. The drinking of the cup is his shed blood. We partake of communion in remembrance of Jesus Christ's resurrection in the appointed time that he will come to commune with us again. This communion covenant recorded in Matthew 26, 26 through 30. And Matthew writes the following. While they were eating, Jesus took bread, gave thanks, and broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat, this is my body. Then he took the cup, gave thanks, and offered to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sin. I will tell you, it, I will not drink of this fruit of the vine from now or until that day when I drink it anew with you in my Father's house. Let us go unto our God in prayer. Oh, gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for this grand opportunity to have sins, our sins, extinguished forever and have the gift of eternal life through your death, burial, and resurrection through our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. As we partake of this memorial, eat this bread, which is your broken body, drink the fruit of the vine, which is your shed blood. Let us do so with a clean heart and an understanding of the meaning of this communion and your sacrifice. Ask it all in Jesus' name. You may partake. Did we overlook anyone? And now the collection. God is the sovereign owner of all resources. Resources like realtors, our individual personal talents, our investments, our intellect, our jobs, and our businesses. He blesses us daily by allowing us to use the resources to earn our income, to support ourselves, and to support our families. He asks us to give liberally back a portion of that increase from his resources to be used for the building of his kingdom. He asks us to give, it, give back joyfully and voluntarily. Remember this, whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. Whoever sows generously will also reap generously. Each man should give what he has decided in his heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves the cheerful giver. And God is able to make all grace abound to you so that in all things, at all times, you have all that you need. You will be abound in every good work. We'll be led in a song while we partake. number seven prayer trouble sometimes are here feeling man hard with fear freedom we all hold dear now as i say humble your heart to god saving from death and wrath seeking the way of 
cross, Christians away. Jesus is coming soon, morning or night. May 